Okay, welcome everybody. This is chapter 11. We're going to begin an exploration of the nervous system. And one of the things that you'll find looking at any A&P textbook is that the nervous system is probably the most complex and content-heavy chapter of any of the other systems. And the reason is that the nervous system is critically important and has a considerable amount of structural and functional complexity to it. So let's start with an overview. The nervous system controls perception and experience in our world. It directs voluntary movement. It's the seat of consciousness, personality, learning, and memory. It regulates many aspects of homeostasis along with the endocrine system, including our respiratory rate, our blood pressure, our body temperature, and our sleep-wake cycle, which we call our circadian rhythm, as well as the pH of our blood. It's divided anatomically into the central and the peripheral nervous system. The central nervous system includes the brain, the brain stem, and the spinal cord. The brain is made up of billions of nerve cells called neurons protected by the bones of the skull. While the spinal cord begins at the foramen magnum and continues through the vertebral foramina of the first cervical to the first or second lumbar vertebrae where it tapers to a point known as the conus medullaris. It's made up of millions of neurons, much fewer than the brain, and it enables the brain to communicate with most of the body below the head and the neck. So if we were to move from inferior to superior with regard to the central nervous system, it would go spinal cord, brain stem, and then brain. The peripheral nervous system is all the nervous tissue that lies outside of the central nervous system. The nerves consist of axons of neurons bundled together with blood vessels and connective tissue, and they carry signals to and from the central nervous system, and they're classed based on their origin or destination. You have 12 pairs of nerves traveling back to or from the brain stem in the brain called cranial nerves and 31 pairs of spinal nerves that travel back to or from the spinal cord. And again, you can see the components of the nervous system here just to orient you. Let's use blue. Okay. You've got the spinal cord here, which I'll trace. Okay, this is the spinal cord. All right, and then we get up to about here, and we're going to have brain stem. We'll do that in green. And then the brain lies atop everything else, and we'll do that in red. And the peripheral nervous system is everything in yellow that I haven't traced. Because the central nervous system is so well protected by the bones of the skull, the bones of the vertebral column, and also a fluid known as cerebrospinal fluid along with a set of membranes called meninges, the neurons of the central nervous system have lost the ability to repair themselves in the face of damage. As a result, if we are injured due to disease or trauma, it's difficult, if not impossible, to regenerate those tissues. However, in the peripheral nervous system, we have retained some ability to regenerate in the face of damage. So that is one immediate difference separating the nervous tissue of the peripheral nervous system from the central nervous system. And the reasons that the CNS can't regenerate follow many particular theories. One um, is that there aren't the proper chemical cues in the tissue of the central nervous system to promote um, neuronal regrowth in the face of damage. Um, Scar tissue interferes with the 
regeneration of intact nerves and nerve pathways. Um, however, nature has seen fit to protect these vital organs very, very well, and this is why they're rarely injured. The nervous system performs millions of tasks simultaneously every second, and these tasks fall into three functional categories, sensory, integrative, or motor. Sensory function gathers information about the internal and external environment of the body. The input is gathered by the sensory or afferent division of the peripheral nervous system and further split into the somatic and visceral divisions. Sensory input from both divisions is carried from sensory receptors to the spinal cord or the brain by spinal and cranial nerves. Something that's very important to understand here is that in order to interpret the world around us as well as act on changes in our internal environment, we have to turn physical changes into electrical information and that's the job of the sensory receptor and the afferent nervous tissue which is to take these physical changes, translate them into electrical information and then carry that electrical information back to the spinal cord, the brain stem, and the brain. The somatosensory division is made up of neurons that carry signals from skeletal muscle, bones, joints, and skin it also transmits signals from organs of vision, hearing, taste, smell, and balance, sometimes known as the special sensory division. Visceral sensory division, made up of neurons that transmit signals from the internal organs, such as the heart, the lungs, the stomach, the kidneys, and the urinary bladder. Now, one of the things that you are going to find out as we progress through this chapter is that most of this visceral information we don't end up being consciously aware of. It's still acted on, but it's generally processed at the level of the brain stem and the hypothalamus. Only occasionally does sensory information from the viscera make it up to our conscious awareness, and what's in charge of that information making it to our conscious awareness is a structure in the brain known as the thalamus, which is like a router for the brain that allows certain stimuli to make it to our conscious awareness and filters out the rest of this stimuli because there, there isn't really anything we can consciously do about a lot of the internal changes that affect our viscera. As a result, we have an entire functional division of the nervous system that's designed to deal with this and it's known as the autonomic nervous system. And we'll talk about it a bit in a minute. Now we can also divide the nervous system into functional divisions in addition to anatomical divisions. The nervous system has an integrative function, which is to analyze and interpret sensory information and determine an appropriate response, either at the conscious or the subconscious level. 99% of integrated sensory information is subconsciously disregarded as unimportant. The remaining sensory stimuli that the central nervous system does respond to leads to a motor response. Motor functions are actions that are performed in response to the integration. They're performed by the motor or efferent divisions of the peripheral nervous system. It can be further split into somatic and autonomic divisions based on organs that neurons come into contact with. The efferent or motor division is motor neurons that carry out motor function. They travel from the brain and the spinal cord through cranial and spinal nerves. Organs that carry out effects are commonly known as effectors. The somatic motor division effectors are skeletal muscle and they are under voluntary control so they're part of the voluntary motor division. The autonomic nervous system, or visceral motor division, is made up of neurons that carry signals to thoracic and abdominal viscera, which are critical for maintaining homeostasis. It also regulates the secretion of glands, the contraction of smooth muscle and cardiac muscle regulation, and is involuntary, meaning that we do not consciously control it. So we term it the involuntary motor division. And what you're looking at here is just a, a setup showing you how this information uh, is processed 
in the uh, afferent or incoming division and how commands are sent out via the afferent or the motor division. So here we have sensory input. Uh, we have the young lady seeing a soccer ball. This information is transmitted from her eyes to her brain. The brain integrates the information, labels the information as to its significance, and then it's going to send that information to the part of the brain responsible for generating an appropriate response. So motor commands will be formulated in the brain and then sent down the brain stem and the spinal cord to the efferent division which will talk to skeletal muscle and we will generate an appropriate response. And what you're looking at here in the lower inset is just the anatomical and functional divisions and how they relate to each other. So we have the central nervous system up top which is in constant two-way communication with the peripheral nervous system which is split into an afferent and an efferent division. The afferent division gets information from skeletal muscle, joints, um, basically the body's physical position in space and the visceral division gets information from the internal organs. That information is then piped in via the peripheral nervous system to the CNS. Um, the somatosensory division is dealt with primarily at the level of the brain while the visceral sensory information is dealt with for the, for the most part at the level of the brain stem and the hypothalamus. The motor division is the outgoing division. We generate commands either at the level of the brain or the brain stem. That information is then sent down the spinal cord and then exit peripheral nerves. And then this information, if it heads to skeletal muscle, is somatic motor information. And we are consciously in control of that. If this information is talking to other targets, such as internal organs or smoother cardiac muscle, it's part of what we call the autonomic nervous system. And when you think autonomic, always think automatic. Okay, so let's go ahead and make that relationship. Autonomic. equals automatic. Okay, the autonomic nervous system has two subdivisions. The sympathetic division and the parasympathetic division. The sympathetic division has a nickname. It's called the fight or flight division. And the parasympathetic division's nickname is the rest and digest division. So you can use these nicknames to kind of guess what the effects of these two subdivisions of the autonomic nervous system will be on internal organ function. Basically, the sympathetic division of the autonomic nervous system will prepare us for battle or to flee. And so examples of some of the effects of the sympathetic nervous system include an increase in blood pressure, in blood sugar, in heart rate, in respiratory rate, in production of sweat, a reduction in the production of urine, and so on. Uh, in the parasympathetic division, um, we see a decrease in heart and respiratory rate, a decrease in blood pressure, and an increase in GI motility and secretion and the routing of blood to the digestive system. Okay, so the parasympathetic division is on most of the time. The sympathetic division kicks in when we anticipate a stressful situation. Nervous tissue is the substance of the nervous system. Neurons are excitable cells responsible for sending and receiving electrical information in the form of action potential and they consist of three parts. The soma, which is the metabolically active region of the neuron that contains organelles, the nucleus, manufactures the proteins needed for the neuron to function, and is also the site of neurotransmitter production. 
both free ribosomes and rough ER are present in this part of the neuron. They're available for protein synthesis. Nissle bodies are actually rough ER. They can be seen with a microscope. The Golgi apparatus is large and has also going to see multiple nuclei, nucleoli in the nucleus. Again, remember that nucleoli are the site of the uh, pr production of ribosomes, and so if you're doing a lot of protein synthesis, you need a lot of ribosomes, thus you need multiple nucleoli. The mitochondria generate energy needed for metabolism. The cytoskeletal elements have microtubules that provide support for the cell and also provide a transportation medium for the cell body in the axon, which is a very long projection that comes off one end of the soma and travels quite some distance until it uh, comes into almost physical contact um, with its target, which could be a gland or a muscle or another neuron. Neurofibrils are made up of intermediate filaments. They provide structural support that extends into the neuron processes, which are cytoplasmic extensions that originate at the cell body and include dendrites and axons, and these allow neurons to communicate with other cells. Dendrites are short branched processes that get input from other neurons. They then transmit this input towards the soma in the form of electrical impulses. Each neuron generally has multiple dendrites. And so you can see an example of what this looks like here. You're looking at nerve tissue, and you can see here these are somas. Okay, uh, they stain rather dark blue in this preparation. Um, the organelles nucleus would be contained in here and then you can see numerous extensions coming off of these soma the short extensions are the dendrites and the long extensions are the axons okay and they are what carry the electrical signal all the way to its next target you'll also notice that there's other tissue in the area glial tissue is designed to assist the neuron in its task and they perform a variety of functions. They provide scaffolding for the neuron. They insulate the neuron's electrical signal. They defend the neuron against attack by pathogens. And they produce and circulate um, cerebrospinal fluid, which is a filtrate of blood that creates an environment in which the neurons are going to be able to function normally. The neuron is so busy sending and receiving electrical information that it really doesn't have time to perform a lot of the other cell functions that a normal cell does, and so these glial cells sort of take care of that for them. And we'll go into detail in terms of what each of the glial cells do uh, shortly. Each neuron has only one axon or nerve fiber that can generate and conduct action potentials. An axon has the following distinct region. The hillock, which is the trigger zone, which is where an action potential is produced. It's also where the axon originates from the cell body. Axon collaterals, which are branches that can extend from the main axon. And telodendria, which are the small branches that come from the axon and its collaterals where these extensions end up. And then the axon terminals, or synaptic bulbs, that come from the telodendria. These are components that communicate with the target. And so you can see an example of what all this looks like down here. Okay? You can see the numerous dendrites coming off of the soma. Okay? There's the nucleus and nucleolus. See the nissle substance. There's the hillock. There's our axon. Now the axon is protected in the peripheral nervous system by glial cells called Schwann cells that form an insulating sheath around the axon in order to insulate and speed conduction of action potentials from their source to their destination. And you can also see the terminals down here near the target cells and also the telodendria. Okay? Um, there's a collateral right there. Okay? Um, important to note again that this is tissue that has limited to no ability to grow or repair. In the peripheral nervous system there is some repair function retained if the axons are cut off from the soma 
the distal end will die. The proximal end can, in some cases, regenerate the axon and innervate the target again, uh, provided that the distal and proximal ends of the brake are near each other. Okay, But in the central nervous system, uh, that programming is lost. Okay, There are too many um, deficiencies in terms of chemical landmarks uh, and built-in repair programs in CNS neurons for them to naturally regenerate in the event that they're damaged. And then we also note that these are amitotic cells, and so if they die, you don't get them back. And so when you lose them, you lose those electrical connections. As a result, you lose the ability for afferent information to travel to the spinal cord, the brainstem, and the brain, and for efferent information to get out to its targets. Okay, the axolemma is the plasma membrane that surrounds the axon and its cytoplasm, also known as axoplasm. Substances travel through the axoplasm using one of two transport types, which are together termed axonal flow. In slow axonal transport, we move substances such as cytoskeletal proteins from the cell body through the axon at a rate of about 3 millimeters daily. While fast axonal transport requires motor proteins and consumes ATP and moves vesicles and membrane-bound organelles um, either back towards the cell body, which we term retrograde transport, or away from the cell body, which we call anterograde transport, at a rate of about 200 millimeters a day and 400 millimeters a day, respectively. Unfortunately, sometimes the cell will transport um, dangerous components using um, these cellular motor proteins and cytoskeletal architecture. An example is poliovirus. This is an infection that impacts central nervous system function, especially the spinal cord, and can result in paralysis and deformity. No cure exists, but we have a vaccine which was actually developed at the University of Cincinnati. The virus accesses the central nervous system by first entering muscle cells and passing into motor neurons at the neuromuscular junction and travels the length of the axon via retrograde axonal transport until it reaches the spinal cord. Other examples of viruses that can do this include herpes simplex virus, um, which is the agent of um, chicken pox and shingles, and rabies virus, as well as toxins, which have the ability to invade the virus by this method. Now, the danger, of course, is that once the virus is inside the nerve cell, uh, depending on the virus type, it can integrate into the DNA and become a permanent feature of these cells and reemerge under the correct sets of conditions. Also, we should note that, generally speaking, nerve cells don't take up medications too well, as a result of a feature known as the blood-brain barrier, which tends to protect nervous tissue from water-soluble compounds. Thus, um, essentially, this is a way for viruses to hide from the effects of medications that could potentially uh, interfere with its replication cycle. And this is, as a result, a very successful tra uh, strategy for this obligate uh, intracellular parasite. Neurons have three main functional regions. The receptive region, which includes the dendrites and cell body, the conducting region, which is the axon, and the secretory region, which includes the axon terminal. And you can see them down here, okay? Receptive region, conducting region, secretory region, okay? Now, what, what, is, the, what is the purpose of each of these regions? In the, in the receptive region, as the name implies, um, what we have are the, uh, the generation of graded potentials. Potentials, okay. Uh, we also have biosynthesis. In the conducting region, we have the generation and propagation of action potentials.
and transport of neurotransmitter and cytoskeletal components. And then finally in the secretory region here we have release of neurotransmitter. And you're going to find some functional variations on this basic neuron model, but all these basic parts will be there in some form. Neurons can be classed according to structural features into three groups. Multipolar neurons have a single axon and multiple dendrites and are 99% of all neurons, while bipolars have one axon and one dendrite and a cell body between them. We find these in the olfactory epithelia and in the retina of the eye. Pseudo-unipolar neurons have only one fused axon that extends from the cell body and divides into two processes. One process carries sensory information from the sensory receptors to the cell body, and the other process carries sensory information from the cell body to the spinal cord. Sensory neurons that carry information related to pain, touch, and pressure are found in the uh, dorsal root of the um, peripheral nervous system. This is where it connects up to the back of the spinal cord. Okay, this is one of the places where you'll find these pseudo-unipolars. Neurons can also be classed into three functional groups. Uh, afferent neurons carry information towards the CNS. The neuron cell bodies in the PNS receive information from sensory receptors and relay information through axons to the brain or spinal cord. These are usually pseudo-unipolar or bipolar. And then interneurons relay information within the central nervous system between sensory and motor neurons. They make up the bulk of neurons in the body. They are multipolar and they communicate with many other neurons. And they're generally found in what we call the gray matter. Okay, so we'll find out in the spinal cord the gray matter is in the core and in the brain the gray matter is on the surface with scattered bits of gray matter deep inside the brain. Efferent neurons carry information away from the cell body in the central nervous system to muscles and glands, and they are mostly multipolar. And so what we're looking at here are some examples of uh, different neurons based on their structure. You can see here these are all examples of multipolar neurons. Again, the way to know it's multipolar is to find the cell body and look at the number of processes coming off of it. If it's more than two that's a multipolar neuron. Here's an example of a bipolar, and here's an example of a pseudo-unipolar. Again, there's the cell body, one process coming off, thus it's considered unipolar. And you can see again the direction of the information from the receptive end to um, the cell body, and then from the cell body uh, out to ultimately where the um, axon terminals are going to synapse on inner neurons um, generally found in the gray matter of the spinal cord. Okay, so a place where you would find these types of neurons, the dorsal root ganglia and the afferent division of the peripheral nervous system. Here you'd find bipolars in the retina and in the olfactory epithelium. And then um, these guys, the Purkinje's and the pyramidals, um, those are found in the gray matter of the brain, okay, and there's our perfect example of a multipolar spinal motor neuron, which we find in the efferent division of the peripheral nervous system. Cell body lies in the spinal cord. The axon uh, is going to extend all the way to its target, which is going to be skeletal muscle. Specific neuron components grouped together include the central nervous system, and if we have a group of neurons 
uh, whose cell bodies lie in a particular region. We call them nuclei, okay, and they generally carry out a particular task. Uh, tracks are bundles of axons in the central nervous system, and generally, um, if we're talking about nuclei, we're talking about gray matter. If we're talking about tracks, we're talking about white matter, okay, in the central nervous system. In the peripheral nervous system, collections of cell bodies are called ganglia, and bundles of axons are called nerves, okay? So let's real quickly note the difference here. Um, here, gray matter. And here, white matter. Okay. Now, the reason in the central nervous system that the tracks are white matter, we're going to find out, is because of the, the high amount of myelin. Myelin is going to be surrounding the axons. And so when you see white matter, I always want you to think in terms of signal transmission. When you see gray matter, I always want you to think in terms of signal processing. Okay. Okay. Uh, neuroglial cells not only provide structural support and protection for neurons, but maintain their environment. Remember, we talked about the fact that the neuron is so busy sending and receiving electrical information that it doesn't have time to do a lot of the other things that you would think of as normal cell functions in order to maintain itself as a living unit. Neuroglia are able to divide and fill in space left behind when neurons die. Uh, they form each type of neuroglial cell. Um, which is specialized for its function, which is another example of the structure function core principle. The four types of glia that are found in the CNS include astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, microglia, and ependymal cells, while the two types in the peripheral nervous system are the Schwann and the satellite cells. So, if we're looking here first at the central nervous system, Astrocytes are star-shaped cells that have processes that terminate in structures called end feet, which anchor the neurons and blood vessels in place and define the three-dimensional structure of the brain. But they also facilitate the transport of nutrients and gases between blood vessels and neurons, and they regulate the extracellular environment of the brain. They also assist in the formation of the blood-brain barrier, which is a protective biological structure that surrounds capillary endothelial tissue and makes them impermeable to most polar compounds and proteins. They also help repair damaged brain tissue by rapid cell division. Again here we're talking about uh, repair via the glial cells dividing. Okay, So you, you could think of the astrocytes basically as doing the grocery shopping and the trash removal for the neurons. Oligodendrocytes found in the central nervous system have processes with flattened sacs that wrap around axons of neurons to form myelin, and this helps to insulate and speed the conduction of electrical information along the axon. Microglia are small cells activated by injury into wandering phagocytic cells in the central nervous system. They ingest disease-causing microbes, dead neurons, and cellular debris. So this is one of the few pieces of pathogenic defense that's found in the central nervous system. Ependymal cells are ciliated cells that line hollow spaces found within the central nervous system. They function to manufacture and circulate cerebrospinal fluid, which is critical for the neurons to function because it maintains a constant pH, constant electrolyte concentration, and fluid balance and temperature. And you can see them all here, okay? so. We can see the oligodendrocytes, right? We can see the astrocytes here in green. Um, we can see, obviously, the uh, neurons here in yellow. And again, the axons wrapped by the myelin sheath generated by the oligodendrocytes. And we can see the microglia in here and the ependymal cells generating the cerebrospinal fluid that circulates through hollow chambers in the brain called ventricles as well as spaces that penetrate the gray matter of the spinal cord called the central canal and the um,
the area around the outside of the brain stem and the spinal cord um, which is the primarily the subarachnoid space and then this fluid as quickly as it's produced and circulates re-enters the venous return to the heart at special structures in the arachnoid mater which is one of the three protective membranes that surround and protect the brain, brain stem and spinal cord uh, it enters these granulations and then heads back into the, the dural venous sinus of the brain and becomes part of the venous return back to the heart and as long as that flow isn't impeded we don't have to worry about damage to the delicate neural tissue as a result of increase in uh, pressure in the central nervous system. Schwann cells in the peripheral nervous system are there to essentially insulate the axons and speed conduction of these electrical signals from their source to their destination while satellite cells surround cell bodies of neurons in the peripheral nervous system and provide supportive functions so that the neurons can continue to function. The myelin sheath is made up of layers of plasma membrane of the Schwann cell or oligodendrocyte in the peripheral and central nervous system respectively. Myelination is the process that forms the myelin sheath from the plasma membranes of the neural glia. They wrap themselves around the axon forming multiple layers of this membrane. Electrical current generated by the movement of ions and body fluids is um, speeded up as a result of the presence of this myelin sheath because the portions of the axon that are insulated allow current to move through very quickly. The lipid content of the myelin sheath insulates the axon like rubber around a copper wire increasing the speed of action potential conduction. Myelinated axons conduct action potentials about 15 to 20 times faster than unmyelinated axons. And again, to give you a sense of scale, uh, the fastest neurons in the body are found in the somatic motor division and they run about 200 miles an hour with regard to the action potentials, whereas some of the slowest are found in the autonomic nervous system and they run between 5 and 10 miles an hour. Other differences noted between myelination in the peripheral and central nervous system include the neurolemma, which is found on the outer surface of myelinated axons in the peripheral nervous system, and it's composed of the Schwann cell nucleus, organelles, and cytoplasm. This is not present in the oligodendrocytes of the central nervous system. The number of axons that are myelinated also varies. Oligodendrocytes have multiple processes that myelinate multiple axons in the CNS, while a Schwann cell only provides myelination for one axon in the PNS, and so it takes many Schwann cells to myelinate an entire axon. The timing of myelination is different as well. Myelination begins early in fetal development in the peripheral nervous system and later in the central nervous system, with very little myelin present in the brain of a newborn. Axons in both the central and peripheral nervous system are longer than neuroglia, so multiple cells have to be um, provided a complete myelin sheath. Internodes are the segments of the axon that are covered by neuroglia. Nodes of Ravnier are the gaps between adjacent neuroglia where the myelin sheath is absent, and they represent areas where the action potential that is um, generated at the hillock is regenerated at each node and eventually um, ends up at the axon terminals resulting in the release of neurotransmitter which is how the electrical signal is going to move from a neuron to its target and it's also going to be the slowest part of any nerve pathway because it relies on diffusion in order to move the electrical signal Small axons in the central and peripheral nervous system are usually unmyelinated. White matter is composed of myelinated axons that appear white, while gray matter is composed of neuron cell bodies and unmyelinated dendrites and axons that appear gray. With regard to regeneration or replacement of damaged tissue, this is nearly non-existent in the central nervous system and is limited in the peripheral nervous system. Neural tissue can regenerate only if the cell body remains intact in the PNS. The regeneration steps 
in the PNS include the axon and myelin sheath, the distal portion degenerating, facilitated by phagocytes, and this is called Wallerian degeneration. Growth processes then form at the proximal end of the axon. Schwann cells and basal lamina form a regeneration tube, and a single growth process grows into the tube and directs the new axon toward its target. Thus, the new axon is reconnected to its target. Okay. Next, we want to discuss the electrophysiology of neurons, and so we're going to examine the fundamental characteristics of neurons that make them ideal for the sending and receiving of electrical information and the translation of chemical or physical information into electrical signals. All neurons are what are called excitable cells. They, along with muscle tissue, have the ability to respond in the presence of stimuli. Uh, these stimuli include chemical signals, local electrical signals, and mechanical changes. The stimuli generate electrical charges across the neuron plasma membrane and are rapidly conducted along the entire length of the membrane. Two forms of electrical charge that occur in neurons include local potentials that travel short distances and action potentials that travel the entire length of an axon. So this is a very important um, distinction that we have to make here. When we're talking about local potentials, what we have to keep in mind is that they they will be proportional to the strength of the signal that generates them generates the graded potential okay they will also fade with distance from the source and they can either be excitatory or inhibitory okay um, the reason that local potentials form on the um, the dendrites and the somas of neurons and let's note again dendrites and somas are where this mostly happens is because of the distribution of the ion channels in that region of the neuron okay um, it's set up such that um, the production of these excitatory or inhibitory action potentials as a result of either chemical or physical change or electrical change in some cases um, can only be propagated along the membrane that covers the dendrites or the soma um, at a distance disproportional to the strength of the signal um, due to essentially um, the, the amount of resistance that's found in that part of the membrane and that has a lot to do with how leaky the membrane is to charge and the distribution of these um, electrically gated ion channels on that part of the neuron okay so the properties in the dendrites and the soma are conducive to the production of local potentials in the presence of the appropriate stimulus an action potential is a different animal. Let's use a different color for an action potential. Let's try green. Okay. An action potential moves at one speed in one direction. Sorry, one direction and one magnitude. A there from its source to its sink to its destination okay and again the reason that action potentials can be produced um, has to do with the components of the membrane in that part of the neuron in the hillock and down the entire length of the axon the distribution of voltage gated ion channels is such that an action potential once produced can generate a repeating cycle 
of changes in the distribution of charge across the cell membrane of the axon that's repeated all the way from the hillock to the axon terminal. Okay, so it, it really isn't possible to produce an action potential anywhere but on the axon. And also another important point about action potentials is that they're always excitatory. Okay, so we should indicate here with a big plus, always excitatory. Electrical charges across the neuron plasma membrane rely on ion channels and arresting membrane potential. If we look at ion channels, ions can't diffuse through a lipid component of the plasma membrane due to the large energy barrier that presents. So they have to rely on protein channels to get across. Different pro protein channels that let these ions pass include leak channels that are always open and continuously allow ions to flow down their concentration gradient between the cytosol and extracellular fluid, gated channels that are closed at rest and open in response to a particular stimulus, whether that be a change in voltage or attachment of a ligand to the channel or physical uh, stimulus that opens the channel. Ligand-gated channels open in response to binding a specific chemical to the receptor. Voltage-gated channels open in response to a voltage change across the cell membrane and mechanically-gated channels open in response to some sort of mechanical stimulus. And you can see examples of each type here, okay? There's our leak channel always open, there's our ligand-gated channel, our voltage-gated, and our mechanically-gated. Resting membrane potential is the separation of charge across the cell membrane when the cell is at rest. Voltage is the electrical gradient that's established by the separation of charge between these two locations. Membrane potential is the electrical potential across the cell membrane which is the source of potential energy for the cell. Every cell in the body at rest quote unquote is polarized when voltage differences across the plasma membrane do not equal zero mill millivolts we have a resting membrane potential of approximately seven, minus 70 millivolts um, which is comparing again the inside of the cell to the outside of the cell, which means that the inside of the cell is negative compared to the outside of the cell. So, again, we have to understand why this happens, okay? The separation of charge, as you're going to find out, is due to, number one, the differential distribution of leak channels in the cell membrane. There are more leak channels, for instance, for potassium than there are for sodium. So potassium tends to leak out of the cytoplasm and into the extracellular fluid more rapidly than sodium tends to leak in. And also the presence of a very important membrane pump called the sodium potassium ATPase which burns one ATP for every three sodiums it pumps out and every two potassiums it pumps in. And also the fact that locked inside the cytoplasm are large negatively charged proteins that cannot escape. Okay, and so all that action together adds up to this unequal distribution of charge across the cell membrane that represents potential energy that can be used to do work when we open the connection or establish a connection between the extracellular fluid and the cytosol, which allows now the positively charged components and the negatively charged components to meet up. This flow of charge is what we call current and the current can be used to do work. So what we want to do first is take a look at resting membrane potential in neurons. Okay, now let's take a look at local potentials in neurons. <coughs> so with local potential what we see are small local changes in the potential of a neuron's plasma membrane and they serve as triggers for long-distance action potentials. Local potentials uh, can cause one of two effects. They can cause depolarization where positive charge enters the cytosol and makes the inside of the cell less negative, for instance a change from minus 70 to minus 60 millivolts, and hyperpolarization where either positive charges exit or negative charges enter the cytosol, making the membrane potential more negative, 
such as a change from minus 70 to minus 80 millivolts. Sometimes known as graded potentials, um, they can vary greatly in size. And the other thing that we should understand about these local potentials is that they can basically run into each other from different locations on the cell and either add or subtract and thus produce either a greater or a more muted uh, potential that is either going to travel further or less far. Okay, Basically it's you could think of it as like interference from from waves. Okay, If you think of the electrical current as a wave um, you know, for instance, if you have um, a sink, say, half full of water that's, that's still, okay, and you put your hands on the surface of the water and start to move them up and down, what you'll find is that the waves you produce can run into each other and add, making a bigger wave, or run into each other and interfere, producing a smaller wave or no wave, okay? And so the same thing holds for these graded potentials. They can either add to each other and thus go further towards the hillock or they can subtract from each other and thus go less far from the hillock and so one of the things that we need to understand is that because the dendrites in the soma of a neuron are basically in a nest of axon terminals from other neurons that we can generate lots of graded potentials um, say at the same time which can then add to each other and make it all the way to the hillock and generate a voltage sufficient to produce an action potential. Or we can um, just have a few of these axon terminals fire rapidly in succession, causing those waves to add and make it all the way to the hillock to produce an action potential. Uh, or we can have a combination of any of those um, events taking place on the dendrites and on the soma. So the the, the thing that determines whether or not the action potential is produced is going to be reaching the threshold voltage at the hillock. If we don't do that, no action potential is generated. If we achieve threshold, then we will produce an action potential. And the reason that the action potential is a big deal is because it's going to carry the electrical information from the trigger zone, the hillock, all the way to the end of the cell. And when it gets there, that's going to result in the release of neurotransmitter neurotransmitter will then flow across a tiny gap between the neuron and its target attached to ligand gated receptors on the target cell and possibly produce a graded potential which could lead to an action potential on the target tissue okay so let's take a look now at generation of an action potential okay so let's take a um, another look at action potentials Okay, so what we notice about action potentials is that they proceed at one speed, at one magnitude, and one direction from where they're produced to where they're going to stop. Um, when they get to the end of the nerve cell, they're going to trigger the release of neurotransmitter. The result is going to possibly be the production of a response in the target tissue. Local anesthetics, such as lidocaine, are commonly administered for surgical or dental procedures and produce temporary numbness in a local area. They block voltage-gated sodium channels of neurons in the treated area, prohibiting depolarization and therefore action potentials that relay pain don't make it to the central nervous system and up to the brain stem in the brain and as a result we don't feel pain during the procedure. Uh, they're non-selective, so they also affect sodium channels in muscles of the area, and this can cause temporary paralysis, which is the reason for often crooked smiles and drooling that follow dental work. Okay, the next thing we want to touch on is this idea of the refractory period. Uh, we talked a little bit about the refractory period when we discussed muscle tissue, but basically it represents a time during which a change in voltage um, cannot move backwards from where it's produced towards its source. Okay, so um, we can divide the refractory period into what we call 
the absolute refractory period and the relative refractory period. Uh, the absolute refractory period is the time during which no electrical stimulus, no matter how powerful, can generate another action potential. Well, the relative refractory period represents a time during which a sufficiently powerful um, electrical change could produce another action potential. But because of the existence of the refractory period, it's impossible for this depolarizing wave, which is the action potential, to move back towards its source. So that's its significance. It's like a biochemical one-way valve for electrical information. During this period of time, after the neuron has generated an action potential, the neuron cannot be stimulated to generate another action potential, and we can divide it into the absolute refractory period, when no additional stimulus, no matter how powerful, can generate another action potential. And this happens to coincide with the time during which voltage-gated sodium channels are activated and inactivated. Sodium channels may not be activated until they return to their resting state with their activation gates closed and their inactivation gates open. Okay, And so you can see that period of time is really in this dark blue area. Okay, And that's when we could possibly generate a new action potential. The relative refractory period follows immediately after the absolute period where only a strong stimulus can produce an action potential. The voltage-gated sodium channels have gone back to their resting state and are able to open again. Potassium channels are activated and the membrane is repolarizing or hyperpolarizing, thus it takes a much larger stimulus to trigger the action potential. Okay, So we've got absolute refractory period during which nothing can produce another action potential here, and then relative refractory period during which a sufficiently powerful electrical stimulus could produce an action potential. And then we have the return to resting membrane potential where all of the sodium and potassium gates are ready and receptive to another electrical change that could activate them. Graded local potentials produce variable changes in membrane potential while action potentials cause a maximum depolarization to plus 30 millivolts. The all or none principle refers to an event that either happens completely or does not occur at all. If a neuron does not depolarize the threshold, then no action potential takes place. Action potentials are not dependent on the strength, the frequency, or the length of stimulus, like local potentials are. Local potentials are reversible. When the stimulus ends, the neuron returns to resting potential. Action potentials are also irreversible. Once the threshold is reached, it cannot be stopped and will proceed to completion. And this is the all or none principle. Signal distance is greater for action potentials versus local potentials. Local potentials are decremental. They decrease in strength over distance, while action potentials are non-decremental Thus, the signal strength does not decrease despite traveling a long distance. And this is why we were saying that an action potential travels at one speed, at one magnitude, and in one direction from where it's produced to where it's going to end up. So let's take a look at the propagation of action potentials. Okay, and this is another look at propagation of action potentials. Okay, a couple of things we should note about action potentials is that the rate of propagation is going to be influenced by the diameter of the axon and the presence or absence of a substance called myelin. The conduction speed determines how rapidly signaling can occur in the nervous system. Axons with large diameters have faster conduction speeds because larger axons have less resistance to conduction, so the current flows more easily. This is a good example of the structure function core principle. While the presence or action absence of myelination gives rise to two types of conduction, saltatory and continuous conduction. In saltatory conduction, we see in myelinated axons, the insulation causes the speed of the action potential to increase in the area of the axon 
that's covered by this insulating material and then what will happen is that we will regenerate the action potential at the areas that are unmyelinated which are known as nodes of Ravnia. Okay? So the idea here is, is it seems as if the action potential jumps from node to node but what really happens is that the action potential which is generated is then um, going to produce a current that moves very rapidly under the insulated portion of the axon and that voltage change then is sufficient to produce another action potential at the node and then the cycle repeats until we get all the way down to the end of the axon where the action potential will result in the fusion of synaptic vesicles containing neurotransmitter with the presynaptic membrane the release of neurotransmitter into the synaptic cleft and possibly the production of a, a action potential in the target provided the graded potentials produced are sufficient to reach threshold on the membrane of the target cell at the trigger zone where the action potential is going to be generated. Okay. Um, keep in mind that the targets for these neurons can be a variety of different tissues. It could be muscle tissue of any type. Um, it could be glandular tissue. It could be other nervous tissue. In continuous conduction, unmyelinated axons are going to have to regenerate the action potential along every square inch of the membrane of the axon. And so it's going to start at the trigger zone and propagate all the way down to the axon terminal. This slows the conduction speed as each successive section of the axon has to depolarize. And so you, you might want to wonder, okay, what kind of speeds are we talking about? Well, if you're talking about the fastest axons in the body, okay, um, they run at about 200 miles an hour. Okay, the slowest axons in the body run about five miles an hour. Now, where do we find these these quick guys? We find them in the somatic motor division of the nervous system. Okay, we find that in the afferent vision division of the peripheral nervous system, where we're bringing information from joints and muscle stretch back into the central nervous system so th these would be motor neurons up here right and these would be sensory down here so those are quick right they need to be quick because we need to be able to get ourselves out of danger rapidly these slow guys are going to be found in places like the autonomic nervous system in both the sympathetic and the parasympathetic divisions. And you might think, okay, well, why can't everything just work at 200 miles an hour? That's a fair question. And the answer is it doesn't have to run at 200 miles an hour for the autonomic nervous system to function properly. So we are going to put our resources where they're going to do the most good, and that ends up being in the somatic motor division and in the uh, afferent somatosensory division. Now, how is it that myelination increases the speed of propagation of an action potential? Well, it has really a lot to do with resistance as the current flows along the axon. Ideally, current flows directly down a wire and illuminates a light bulb in this example from a mechanical device. If we touch the wire with a metal probe, most of the current will instead flow down into the probe and this would produce a short circuit. This is why you worry about um, electrical insulation fraying um, that could potentially cause the electrical device to malfunction. If the wire is encased in a material that is a poor conductor of electricity, current is unable to move from the copper wire to the probe and this prevents a short circuit. Okay, so you can see the utility there. Okay, we avoid losing the electrical current to outside influences as a result again of the um, insulation. In an unmyelinated axon, it resembles the wire in the illustration to the right. The axolemma is leaky with respect to current, so current flows easily from the axoplasm to the extracellular fluid, just as current flowed easily from the copper wire to the metal probe. Thus, the current dissipates over a short distance, which could cause action potentials to fail. Therefore, 
we have to constantly regenerate the action potential along the axle lemma and this requires the opening of voltage gated ion channels this takes more time and so the propagation is slow okay and so um, it, again the unmyelinated axons again you want to have an idea of the speeds you're talking in the 5 to 10 mile an hour range okay something like that okay in a myelinated axon which resembles the drawing to the right um, the myelin is a good insulator and thus it prevents the current from leaking through the axial lemma the signal strength decreases very little as it travels through an internode and does not have to be regenerated in the insulated part of the axon at the unmyelinated nodes the current begins to dissipate and the action potential has to be regenerated the action potentials also appear to leap from node to node through the axoplasm much more quickly than in continuous conduction and so again we're going to give you an idea of the relative speeds uh, we're talking here on the area about 200 miles an hour okay so 200 mile an hour for these guys 5 to 10 miles an hour up here okay um, <clears throat> and we have to be clear about this as well you might wonder okay well why don't we just insulate the entire axon with no nodes and then just generate the action potential at the hillock and that'll result now in the release of neurotransmitter at the axon terminals and the answer to that question is that even though we would um, we would travel relatively quickly under the insulated portion of the axon it would still eventually fade out the current's not going to be sufficiently powerful to go all the way down to the end of the axon even though it's generated at the hillock so we have to periodically regenerate the action potential as the current begins to fade the current does begin to fade even as it passes under the insulated portion of the axon and so that's why the nodes are there in the first place in order to be strategically spaced such that we're able to produce a threshold voltage at the node just as the current is fading as it arrives at the node from the previous node and so we can regenerate a fresh action potential and continue all the way down to the axon terminal now little kind of a think about it thing what do you think would happen if a myelinated axon were to lose its myelin okay and if you consider what we've discussed the conclusion you'll come to is that the action potential would probably fail to make it to its target and the reason for that is that as the insulation is lost the speed of conduction and the resistance to the current would increase the result is that we wouldn't be able to regenerate the action potential um, where the voltage gated sodium channels are strategically placed because we will probably fail to reach threshold voltage there and thus the electrical signal would fail to make it to its target and we wouldn't release any neurotransmitter and wouldn't induce any change on our target you might wonder okay well give me an example of when that happens in a disease like muscular dystrophy okay not muscular dystrophy sorry in a disease such as multiple sclerosis um, what happens is that the myelin sheath is destroyed as a result of misdirected immune activity and the result is that the target tissues become uh, less responsive to electrical signals because the electrical signals um, make it to the target much more seldom we can classify axons by their conduction speeds type A fibers are the fastest they run again like I said around 200 miles an hour or so they're the largest diameter fibers around between 5 and 20 micrometers and they are heavily myelinated they're found in sensory and motor axons associated with skeletal muscle and joints type B fibers are slower they run about 32 miles an hour they're mostly myelinated with intermediate diameter axons they're found in autonomic efferents and in some sensory axons and then type C fibers which run around five miles an hour 
have narrow diameters and are unmyelinated. These include efferent fibers of the autonomic nervous system and sensory axons that transmit pain, temperature, and pressure sensations. A little word on multiple sclerosis. This is what happens when the immune system attacks the myelin sheath of the central nervous system. It's an autoimmune disorder causing progressive loss of the sheath, which results in loss of current from the neurons. And what we see is progressive slowing of action potential propagation. The symptoms, again, depend on the region of the central nervous system that's hit. Most exhibit changes in sensation, such as numbness, as well as changes in behavior and cognitive ability and motor dysfunction, including paralysis. Okay, so again, it all depends on um, which nerves are actually attacked. And you might wonder, okay, well, why does autoimmune disorder happen in the first place? And it, that's kind of an interesting question. A um, couple of short answers. One of the things that happens during the formation of the immune system includes the selection of cells that are tolerant of the body's own antigens and will destroy anything that does not resemble the body's own antigens. Antigens are just molecules on the cell surface that identify the cell as belonging to the body. And if you come into the body from the outside world with the wrong chemical ID tag, you're going to become a target of the immune system. And the other cells, those that would not tolerate the self-antigens that would attack and destroy them, are either destroyed or are rendered in a state of energy. It's like a suspended animation during which the cell is, is alive, but it's not participating in immune function. And it's thought that perhaps these cells wake up uh, as a result of um, changes in the production of cell signals, such as cytokines or maybe changes in hormone levels. It's really hard to tell. And then they turn around and attack our body's own tissues. Another theory is exposure to cross-reacting antigens, where as a result of your activities of daily living, you get exposed to an antigen that's similar but not identical to your own, causing you to produce um, white blood cells that will attack that antigen but will also cross-react with the body's own antigens. And so those are a couple of proposed mechanisms. And again, it could be um, there could be other mechanisms at work. It could be a combination of any of those mechanisms. Okay, synapses. Neurons have to communicate with other cells, including other neurons, in order for them to function. A synapse is where a neuron meets its target cell. In the case of another neuron, it's called a neuronal synapse and can be either electrical or chemical. <coughs> neuronal synapses occur between an axon of one neuron and another part of another neuron. An exodendritic synapse is a synapse of an axon of one neuron in the dendrite of another. An exosomatic is going to be between the axon of a neuron and the soma of the target. And an axoaxonic synapse is going to be a synapse between the axon of one neuron and the axon of another neuron. So you've got all different possibilities here. The following terms are used to describe which neuron is sending and which is receiving the message, regardless of the synapse type. A presynaptic neuron is a neuron that sends the message from its terminals. A postsynaptic neuron receives the message from the presynaptic neuron and its cell body or dendrites. Synaptic transmission is the transfer of chemical or electrical signals between neurons at a synapse. It's a fundamental process for most neurons of the nervous system. It allows for voluntary movement, cognition, sensation, and emotion. An average presynaptic neuron forms synapses with about a thousand postsynaptic neurons. So there are a lot of targets out there. A postsynaptic neuron can have as many as 10,000 synaptic connections with different presynaptic neurons. And then we have electrical synapses, which occur between cells that are connected to each other through gap junctions. The axolemma of each cell in synapse are nearly touching. The gap junctions align channels that form pores so that ions can flow from one cell to the next. They're found in areas of the brain responsible for programmed automatic behaviors such as breathing. And outside the brain, they're found in cardiac and visceral smooth muscle and allow for coordinated muscle activity. 
Um, and again, this the movement of this electrical wave is very, very um, quick in electrical junctions compared to synapses. It turns out in a nerve pathway, um, the slowest part of any nerve pathway is the synapse because it relies on diffusion in order to happen. So the more synapses you have, the slower the overall speed of the pathway is going to be. And that's one of the reasons why when we look at reflexes a little bit later on, you're going to find out that you have very few synapses between the stimulus and the response. Electrical current can flow directly from the axoplasm of one neuron to the next in an electrical synapse. This creates two unique features for the synapse. Transmission can go in two directions. Either neuron can be pre- or postsynaptic, depending on the direction of the current flow. And the transmission is instantaneous. The only delay is the time it takes the presynaptic neuron to depolarize, which is less than a tenth of a millisecond, and this is much faster than chemical synapses, which run one or more milliseconds. Chemical synapses are the majority of synapses in the nervous system. They're more efficient than electrical synapses because they convert electrical signals into chemical signals, so no signal strength is lost. But in the electrical synapse, some signal strength is lost. If we compare these two synapses, there are three structural differences between chemical and electrical synapses that we should note. Synaptic vesicles filled with chemical messengers transmit signals from the pre to the postsynaptic neuron at chemical synapses. The synaptic cleft is an extracellular fluid filled space that separates the pre and postsynaptic neurons or the, the presynaptic neuron and its target, say if it were muscle or glandular tissue. Found in the chem chemical synapses, um, we, we see um, sometimes uh, modifying enzymes that help to break down the neurotransmitters in order to help to turn the electrical pathway off, such as acetylcholinesterase. Gap junctions connect neurons in electrical synapses, physically connect them, so that literally their cytoplasms are almost continuous. Postsynaptic neurons have neurotransmitter receptors, which bind to the neurotransmitter produced from the presynaptic neuron that is diffused across the cleft. There's a time gap um, between the arrival of the action potential and its effect on the postsynaptic membrane. Chemical synapses are also unidirectional, unlike electrical synapses, but do allow for variable intensities of signal. Okay? And again, the varying intensity of signal is going to be proportional to the amount of neurotransmitter released and the number of ligand-gated uh, ion channels that are engaged on the target. More neurotransmitter released from the presynaptic neuron generally leads to a stronger response at the postsynaptic neuron. Okay, if we look at the events at a chemical synapse, we note that neuronal synapses are more complicated than neuromuscular junctions. There are multiple neurons that secrete many different types of excitatory or inhibitory neurotransmitters. An action potential in a presynaptic neuron triggers voltage-gated calcium channels in the axon terminal to open, causing an influx of calcium into the um, synaptic terminal, into the, um, the, um, ac the axon terminal of the presynaptic neuron. And this triggers neurotransmitter release into the synaptic cleft. The neurotransmitters then bind to receptors on the postsynaptic neuron, causing ion channels to open and leading to a local potential and possibly an action potential if we reach threshold. Okay? So again, unidirectional transmission, the effect can be excitatory or inhibitory, and it's, the effect is going to be proportional to the amount of neurotransmitter that is released okay, on the target. So let's take a look at synaptic transmission as an overview. Okay, in chemical synapses, the postsynaptic potentials are local potentials found in the membrane of the postsynaptic neuron. The membrane potential of a postsynaptic neuron moves closer to threshold, which is caused by small depolarizations on the postsynaptic membrane 
and these are called excitatory postsynaptic potentials. And you can see examples of how the current changes here. You've got, again, the opening of a ligand-gated sodium channel as one example. Positive charge flows into the cytoplasm of the target cell, and the result now is that the voltage goes upward from minus 70 to minus 55, okay? Um, so that would be an example of an excitatory potential because we're moving closer to the the threshold voltage, which if it, if it is achieved at the hillock, will result in an action potential being produced. The membrane potential of postsynaptic neurons can also move further away from threshold, causing small local hyperpolarizations, such as the opening of chloride or potassium channels, and this is called an inhibitory postsynaptic potential. And you can see it illustrated here as we move uh, from minus 70 down to minus 90 millivolts, and this reduces the likelihood that we will achieve the threshold voltage at the hillock and produce an action potential. So let's take a look at postsynaptic potentials and an overview. Synaptic transmission can be terminated by ending the effects of neurotransmitter by one of three methods. Some neurotransmitters will diffuse away from their ligand-gated uh, channels and can be reabsorbed into a neuron or into an astrocyte. Neurotransmitter can be broken down in a synaptic cleft by enzymes designed to degrade it, and the byproducts of the reaction reabsorbed by the presynaptic membrane for reassembly of the neurotransmitter in preparation for the arrival of the next action potential. And some neurotransmitters are reabsorbed into the presynaptic neuron by a process known as reuptake. If we, we don't do this, the net effect will be that the nerve pathway will stay on longer and stronger. Okay? It also turns out that most drugs that modulate nerve activity act at the chemical synapse, either by dilating or constricting the amount of time that the neurotransmitter uh, exerts its effect on the target cell. Okay? And there are, there are drugs that will um, do any number of things in order to change the effect the neurotransmitter has on the target tissue. So let's take a look at the termination of synaptic transmission. Okay, let's talk a little bit about spiders for a minute. Spiders and scorpions are, are members of a group of organisms called arthropods. That means jointed legs. Many of their venoms affect neuronal synapses, and they're called neurotoxins. The black widow, which can be identified by having a red hourglass-shaped spot on her abdomen, produces a toxin that causes release of neurotransmitter, leading to repetitive stimulation of postsynaptic neurons, while the bark scorpion, which is the most lethal of the 40 species in the U.S., has a venom that prevents postsynaptic sodium channels from closing. The result is that the membrane remains polarized and continues to fire action potentials. Okay, so again, the idea here is that um, we're we're causing the excitatory um, stimulus to last longer than it otherwise would. Mechanisms are different in both of these toxins, but the result is to overstimulate the postsynaptic neuron. Symptoms include hyperexcitability of muscle, sweating, nausea, vomiting, and difficulty breathing. The treatment depends on the amount of venom received and the availability of medical care. In severe cases, we usually use anti-venom in order to block the effects of the toxin. Okay? Uh, a couple of notes here. I uh, just want to, again, anti venom. Which is basically antibody against the toxic components of the venom. And over here, um, instead of saying the membrane remains polarized, we want to say the M membrane remains depolarized. Okay. 
Okay. Talk a little bit about neural integration. Neurons get input both inhibitory and excitatory from multiple neurons, each of which influences whether an action potential is produced. In neural integration, this is a process in which postsynaptic neurons integrate incoming information to a single effect. In summation, that's a phenomenon where all input from several postsynaptic potentials are added together to affect the membrane potential at the trigger zone. An action potential will only be produced if we reach threshold voltage at the hillock, and that's going to result from the sum of the influences of the IP and the EPSPs. If the sum of the IPSPs is greater than the EPSPs, then the membrane will hyperpolarize and we won't hit threshold and won't generate an action potential. If the sum of the EPSPs is greater than the IPSPs and we reach threshold voltage, then an action potential will be produced. So this is a good way to keep this in your head. The link between local and action potential is summation. As the excitatory local potentials sum, they add, like waves on a pond, adding, okay? They depolarize the trigger zone to threshold and possibly generate an action potential, okay? If they interfere, such as an IPSP hitting an EPSP, then we're not likely going to reach our threshold voltage, okay? And so, how can this happen? This can happen as a result of temporal summation, where a few of these axon terminals fire um, many times in a row, okay, and the, the, the net effect of the current adds, or it can be the result of spatial summation, where many axon terminals fire at the same time, and all of these EPSPs add together and hit threshold at the hillock. So those are the two types of summation, right? Temporal summation and spatial summation, okay? And what's the end product of both? The end product of both, uh, if successful, is to reach threshold and generate that action potential. If we don't generate that action potential, the neuron's not going to relay the signal to its target. IPSPs also subject are, are also subject to both temporal and spatial summation, but have an inhibitory effect, making it less likely for the hillock to reach threshold. Okay, so you have to envision that the, the soma and the dendrites are being bombarded with this stuff all the time. They're being hit with a neurotransmitter that produce IPSPs and EPSPs and again what determines whether we fire is reaching threshold at the trigger zone. Okay, let's talk a little bit about neurotransmitters. Nearly all neurotransmitters undergo a similar pattern of use despite the fact that there's over a hundred known substances. They do share similar features. They're made in, a cell, in the cell body or the axon terminal and packaged into synaptic vesicles. They're released from axon terminals of presynaptic neurons and cross the synaptic cleft to bind to specific receptors on the postsynaptic membrane. And the effects are rapidly terminated through removal or degradation. The type of receptor a neurotransmitter binds to on a postsynaptic membrane determines the response. Okay, and there's two types. Ionotropic receptors are found as components of a ligand-gated ion channel, and they directly control the movement of ions into or out of the neuron when they bind neurotransmitter, while metabotropic receptors are found within the plasma membrane associated with a separate ion channel, and they're directly connected to metabolic processes that are initiated when the neurotransmitter binds. An example, G-proteins are a group of intracellular enzymes associated with many metabotropic receptors. They activate a cascade of enzyme-catalyzed reactions, ultimately forming intracellular chemical messenger molecules called second messengers, um, keeping in mind that the neurotransmitter is the first messenger. Second messengers can open or close ion channels in postsynaptic membranes, thus changing the membrane potential. Cyclic AMP is a common second messenger. It's generated from ATP via the action of an enzyme called adenylate cyclase, and this has multiple functions in neurons. Cyclic AMP can bind to a group of enzymes that can add phosphate groups to ion channels, and this either triggers the channels to open or to shut. Okay, 
Um, again, um, enzymes that add phosphate groups to other proteins are called kinases. K-I-N-A-S-E-S. -E so you're looking here at different receptor examples, different um, um, ion channel examples. Okay, The ionotropic receptor shown here, when it hits its ligand, the ligand pops the channel and this allows the flow of charged particles. Over here we have a metabotropic receptor where the ligand binds to the receptor. This activates the G protein which then can have an effect on an ion channel. Okay, And this is just a look at some of the major neurotransmitters. Note that the binding of neurotransmitter to receptor leads to either an excitatory or an inhibitory postsynaptic potential. Most neurotransmitters can have both effects depending on which postsynaptic neuron receptors they bind to. A single neurotransmitter thus may have several receptor types. The major neurotransmitters are classed in this table into four groups based on their chemical structure. Okay, So again, we've got um, a variety of source material from which to make neurotransmitter. A lot of these are amino acids or amino acid derivatives. Um, in fact, most of them are. Some are small stretches of amino acids called neuropeptides. Um, substance P is another example. Um, neuropeptide Y and so on. And then it shows the, um, the building blocks for each of these receptor types and the postsynaptic effect and the location of the target tissue and the types of receptors that they bind to. <coughs> Note here that acetylcholine and um, epinephrine are going to generally bind to ionotropic receptors um, as does glutamate and GABA okay, and glycine. The rest are metabotropic. Acetylcholine is a small molecule neurotransmitter used in the nervous system. Cholinergic synapses bind to acetylcholine. This is found, for instance, in the neuromuscular junction and within the brain and spinal cord and in the autonomic nervous system. They are largely excitatory, but they do exhibit some inhibitory effects in the PNS. They're synthesized from choline and acetyl-CoA and then packaged into synaptic vesicles and they are quickly degraded by acetylcholinesterase, which is an enzyme in the synaptic cleft. The byproducts of the reaction are then taken back into the presynaptic neuron and recycled and reused. Biogenic amines are a class of five neurotransmitters made from amino acids. They're used in the central and peripheral nervous system for a variety of functions such as regulation of homeostasis and cognition, the first three form catecholamines. Um, these are made from the amino acid tyrosine. They're mostly excitatory and they include norepinephrine and epinephrine, also sometimes known as noradrenaline and adrenaline. Um, epinephrine is found mainly in the autonomic nervous system where it influences heart rate, blood pressure, and the rate of digestion. In the central nervous system, it regulates our circadian rhythm, our attention, and our feeding behavior. Epinephrine is also used in the autonomic nervous system and it has functions similar to norepinephrine but it's also used as a hormone by the endocrine system. Dopamine is used by the central nervous system and coordinates movement. Involved, It's also involved in emotion and in motivation. Serotonin is synthesized from the amino acid tryptophan most serotonin secreting neurons are found in the brain stem. These axons project into multiple areas of the brain and their functions include mood regulation, emotion, attention, feeding behavior, and the control of daily rhythm. Um, where you might have seen serotonin before is regarding a class of drugs called SSRIs. Okay. SSRIs, it stands for Selective Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitor. Um, these are drugs such as Paxil, okay, and Buspar. 
And the idea behind these is that the longer the serotonin stays in the synaptic cleft by inhibiting its reuptake, um, the calmer will become. The, these are drugs that tend to reduce anxiety and also depression. Histamine is synthesized from the amino acid histidine and is involved in the regulation of arousal and attention. Glutamate is the most important excitatory neurotransmitter in the central nervous system. It binds to ionotropic postsynaptic receptors and opens channels that allow for both sodium and calcium ions to move across the cell membrane, generating EPSPs in the postsynaptic target. Glycine and GABA are inhibitory neurotransmitters that induce IPSPs on the postsynaptic neuron by opening chloride channels causing hyperpolarization. Again, that's going to make it less likely to achieve the threshold voltage at the hillock and generate an action potential. Neuropeptides are a group of neurotransmitters that have wide variety of functions throughout the nervous system and have to be synthesized in the cell body and transported to the axon. Substance P <coughs> is released from type C sensory afferents that carry information about pain and temperature and they're also released by other neurons in the brain, spinal cord, and in the gut. Opioids make up a group of 20 neuropeptides, including endorphins and enkephalins, which elicit relief from pain and are nervous system depressants. And so they get their name from the fact that they have a shape similar to opioids, such as morphine and heroin. Neuropeptide Y is a neuropeptide involved in feeding behavior and may mediate hunger or the feeling of being full. Okay, our next topic is to address the different functional groups of neurons. Neuronal pools are groups of inner neurons within the central nervous system. Now most of these are going to be found within the gray matter in the nervous system in the CNS. Um, this would be in the core of the spinal cord and in the brain, this would be on the cerebral cortex and in the basal ganglia. These are composed of neuroglial cells, dendrites, and axons in one location and cell bodies in another location. The type of information processed here um, in a pool is defined by its synaptic connections. The connection between pools let complex mental activity such as planned movement cognition and personality be executed. Input neurons initiate a series of signals that starts the activity of a particular pool. So what you're looking at here again is a sort of a schematic of the setup. Here you have the axon of the input neuron and then we have a synapse with the postsynaptic neurons and the result now is that we have um, the signal dispersed amongst many many targets okay so what we're looking at here is with fewer synapses the input neuron alone can't trigger an action potential with more synapses the firing of the input neuron can trigger an action potential and again over here with fewer synapses the input neuron cannot trigger an action potential and why is that? Again, you have to consider what's happening on the soma and on the dendrites, which is the production of an EPSP, but also IPSPs, and it's their net effect at the hillock that's going to determine whether or not an action potential is generated. Okay, so um, this is what we mean here um, by the activity in a neuronal pool. Neuronal circuits are patterns of synaptic connections between neuronal pools, there's two basic types of neural circuits. Diverging circuits that begin with a single input neuron that branches out to make contact with multiple postsynaptic neuronal targets that follow the same pattern. They are critical because they allow a single neuron to communicate with multiple parts of the brain or the body. A characteristic of these, um, those transmitting incoming sensory information sent from the spinal cord to different neuronal pools in the brain for processing. Okay, so you can see here again um, how this is operating. The input neuron in the brain sends signals to multiple 
muscle fibers. And how can this happen? Again, because of the way the circuitry is laid out. Notice that we have um, an expanded number of targets as we head from where the command is generated ultimately down to the uh, lower motor neurons which are going to uh, send the information out to their targets which are the um, muscle fibers and the upper motor neurons also are going to talk to a wide variety of targets thus again increasing the influence of the initial motor command and then here we have um, in afferent information uh, we have an input neuron uh, into the spinal cord that sends signals to different parts of the brain we enter the central nervous system we talk to a variety of interneurons they're going to talk to a variety of uh, targets um, in the CNS uh, that are going to relay information to multiple cortical regions and the result is going to be um, the the perception and then the sensation of the stimulus. Converging circuits basically have the opposite configuration of diverging circuits. Here axon terminals from multiple input neurons converge onto a single postsynaptic neuron. They're critical, critical for the control of skeletal muscle movement and they allow the nervous system to respond to sensory information that it collects and processes. So the idea here is integration. We gather information from a wide variety of sources. Uh, we focus it into a relatively small pool of neurons. The result now is that we target a specific region in the CNS and we go from again sensation to perception uh, and then ultimately that information is utilized to generate some sort of a command either at the involuntary or voluntary level. The central nervous system has two mechanisms that stabilize neuronal circuits to prevent electrical activity from becoming chaotic. The first mechanism are inhibitory circuits that provide a negative feedback mechanism to control activity in other neural circuits, while the second mechanism is synaptic fatigue by which synaptic transmission gets progressively weaker with prolonged and intense excitation. And the reason for this is relatively simple. If we continue to um, utilize the synapse uh, to, its, um, to its limit of capability, the result is going to be that when uh, action potentials make it to the end of the presynaptic uh, neuron, you're not going to be able to generate sufficient neurotransmitter to induce a change on the postsynaptic uh, cell membrane and the result is that we're not going to produce a excitatory or inhibitory postsynaptic potential on the target tissue. The inhibitory circuits are a way to essentially blunt the um, effect of the action potential on the synaptic terminal um, again they are essentially going to hyperpolarize sections of the the axon and the result is going to be a reduction in the frequency of the action potentials we can also feed back to the soma or the dendrites and have the same effect okay that brings us to the end of this chapter. I will join everybody in the next pod podcast. Remember, review this material as it will um, show up on the, uh, the quizzes and the exams. Thank you for listening.